After more than three decades as co-constructor, renovator and architect of the European chemical control legislation, Björn Hansen, currently executive director at the European Chemicals Agency, leaves for a well-deserved retirement. In this Chemcom TV interview, we take a trip down memory lane with Björn. Memory Lane depicted in a classic Chemcorn cartoon inspired by the famous fable of three pigs who built three houses. The first two houses of straw and sticks were blown down, but the third house, built brick by brick, was durable and resilient. Björn, in this interview we will look back together on your career at the heart of EU chemicals policy making and implementation of course, and harvest or try to harvest the valuable lessons learned of your three decades in this arena. What initiated new chemical control legislation? How was it implemented? What were the challenges? And of course, your role in it. Many people will say, Björn, that you are a man with a mission and vision. What was your mission when you started? Well, it's very easy now, after 30 years, to think back and reconstruct what my mission was. But first, a few uh, words of honesty. And then how I see it now, what I was doing back then. I mean, I started when I was 27. Uh, recruited from the university, from looking at uh, mathematics uh, into the big world of the European Union back then. So I was blue-eyed, definitely learned a lot, and I don't think I was clear in my mission back then uh, when I started. But looking back and reflecting on how I was back then and started out, I think my main mission actually, you can summarize, was try to be a good civil servant. And what I mean with good civil servant is I work for the citizen, but I also need to make sure that what I do makes a difference. Now, let's start at the beginning. Let's zoom into the 90s. Uh, you worked in ISPRA, Italy, at the European Chemicals Bureau, at the Commission's Joint Research Center, as area coordinator for the existing substances team. What were the key focus areas and what was happening in the world that triggered a change in approach to chemicals? It actually started in the world in the late 80s. Uh, it started in the US, as so much happens uh, in this world. Something starts one place and it ping pong somewhere else and it basically develops. But it started in the US uh, with uh, the, uh, the Academy of Sciences there. Uh, which published a report about there not being any data on chemicals on the market. And that rolled and kick-started um, a lot of discussion on uh, developing uh, systems for controlling uh, new and existing chemicals. And uh, that discussion took place at OECD, spilled over through the OECD into the EU, and that started the existing substances regulation, which was all about we have lots of substances on the market in Europe, and we know very little, bit, little about it. Um, so let's get a legal instrument to get information and start doing something about it. Okay. Hey, a risk assessment in the 90s was mainly based on a scientific approach, eh? executed by authorities with lots of challenges. In one decade, only a limited number of dossiers was completed. Was it a mission impossible then? Well, the beautiful thing about Missions Impossible, at least if you watch the movies, is that in the end, the Mission Impossible is possible. And I think that that's what chemicals leg legislation has reinvented over and over again. It started out as a Mission Impossible because you had some countries who did risk assessments. You had many countries who didn't. There was no one methodology. And there was definitely not one tradition on what is science and what is policy. And hence, where should the risk assessment stop? So yes, it started out as a mission impossible, but I think as also you see through the decades, you have a lot of very talented uh, people that you get together and uh, they have a common goal, they'll figure it out. And that was what happened here. Uh, we found out how to do an EU risk assessment on really, really difficult substances, short chain chlorinated paraffins, the brominated flame retardants, and come to conclusions that these substances presented a risk. And this was an EU conclusion. All member states agreed. Um, indeed, mission impossible, but we managed it just like in the movies. Okay, talking about figuring things out, while working on these assessments, industry provided lots of comments. There's a lack of data, please check more uses, etc. Um, can you describe how the role of industry has changed in the shaping of EU chemicals policy? And do you see similarities between the comments of industry then and the current discussion on, for instance, essential uses? I, 
I think that there are similarities, but there's clearly also differences. Um, I think uh, the similarity is that industry wants a science-based approach. That's what you've seen all the way through. And uh, I think the whole debate around that similarity is always how much science is actually needed in order to take a regulatory decision. So it's all about actually needed science. And that's where the, the, the bouncing back and forth is. And in our first round of chemicals legislation, the existing substances regulation, we needed a lot of science. And then we learn from that later on. We'll get there, of course, with REACH, where it turned out saying, ah, maybe you don't need that much science. Differences is very much that I think that industry, if you look at the 90s compared to now, uh, has definitely recognized that there are lots of changes that are needed in order to meet the global challenges that we have today in sustainable development. The global challenges that industry uh, uh, recognized or acknowledged in the 1990s, even though sustainable development was equally high on the agenda, were not the same. So clearly they have come a long way in their thinking, in seeing their responsibility in solving the problem. They might still need a couple of notches, but they're much further than they were 30 years ago. Okay. And you already mentioned the OECD. Eh? In the 90s and the years to follow, you made considerable contributions to the OECD's chemicals assessment program. Bob Dieter from the OECD has a message for you. Hi Björn. I would just like to uh, highlight two of your achievements from, uh, from the early 90s, uh, and specifically with regard to the uh, uh, OECD program and the uh, OECD High Production Volume Chemicals program. I think it was you who were influential in ensuring that the uh, uh, results of the existing substances regulation could seamlessly fit uh, and be contributed to the uh, OECD program. Uh, thereby allowing uh, EU countries to fully uh, comply with their with their com commitments. And I think it's no surprise also that uh, you copy pasted some of the experiences gained through the uh, OECD program into the REACH regulation. And it, uh, I was, I'm thinking especially, especially of the uh, uh, registration part. And the other achievement I would like to highlight is, of course, Euclid. I think you were one of the very few people uh, who in 1993 believed that uh, Euclid was going to harmonize the world. And although uh, it took uh, 30 years, uh, I think today we, uh, it, it might just happen. So these are two of the uh, milestone I think that uh, you can be very proud of. One part of your OECD legacy, of course, is the CUSA toolbox. Are you proud of this toolbox and why is it so valuable? Yes, I'm proud, uh, but I got to put it in context because uh, I was so lucky in my career to have some important functions. So little old me uh, Matt, was so lucky to be chosen to have some important functions. And in fulfilling those functions, I was lucky enough to work with a lot of people that actually could achieve such fantastic things like the QSR toolbox. So it's basically, I was in my, these, lucky enough to be in this function, and I uh, had my hat on of remembering I'm a civil servant. I'm getting paid to do good uh, for the citizen, and what good can I then do? And that I, I've been able to achieve with a, with a number of other colleagues working together in a team. And on the QSR toolbox, what is um, fantastic about it is that, first of all, it's an OECD tool. So this means that you have a lot of countries around the world who have agreed on a way of uh, estimating chemical properties, grouping and estimating chemical properties, which is transferable. Uh, so it's uh, the same logic, same approach, same way of, of, of thinking, which creates efficiencies in a regulatory context, but it also aligns thought. And it's this alignment of thought that's the big strength. Uh, and I think that that's one of the big uh, impacts of the QSR tool, toolbox. And I'm definitely proud to have been allowed to have this function uh, where I was able to help out uh, to get this uh, toolbox up and running. Very good. Something you can definitely be proud of. Hey, Bob Dietrich already mentioned REACH. Um, on the 13th of February 2001, uh, the European Commission um, adopts the white paper setting out a future strategy uh, for the uh, community policy on chemicals. So let's move from the 90s 
to the zeros, uh, so from ISPA to Brussels, uh, because in June 2003, you joined uh, the chemicals unit of DJ Environment, um, where you were involved in the development of REACH from its very early days. In Brussels, you worked together with Rob Donkers, the founding father of REACH. Also, Rob has a message for you. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Björn. You did not think I would like to miss this opportunity, <laughs> do you? <laughs> Let's go back to the making of REACH. It all started with the urgent request from member states to overhaul the then legislation on existing chemicals. Member states and the Commission were responsible for drafting risk assessments and the Commission to draft risk management measures. So the burden of proof was on authorities, as is still the case in the United States. In most cases, the chemical industry didn't have a clue where their products were ending up. So much for responsible care and product stewardship. Some examples, tributyl tin in diapers and in the jerseys of the German football Mannschaft, and leaking phthalates in rubber duckies for babies. I came several times to ISPRA to pick your brains, how a new approach could be framed. I'm still grateful for those discussions. It was a rough and tough process to write the white paper and later the REACH regulation, not least due to some colleagues in DG Enterprise who shared every single internal draft with CIVIC, which I then received back on my desk with a stamp of the German rep. You were in DG Environment in 2003 when this all came to a climax. By the way, the white paper proposed to establish a central entity to administer the REACH system, so in a way you kindly helped to create your own job at ECA. Absolutely. But this now comes to an end. Therefore, Björn, welcome to the Club of Pensionados of the European Union. I hope that you will enjoy this new status as much as I do. And we will finally have our lunch, which is long overdue. Mange tak for being a very nice and competent colleague. And for your friendship. Du, dus tot ziens, Björn. Tot kijk. <laughs> the making of reach, Björn. I happened to be in Brussels in December 2006 when REACH, the most complex regulation in EU history, passed the European Parliament. Among others, the Commission stated it will increase our knowledge about chemicals, enhance safety and spur innovation while encouraging substitution of highly dangerous substances for safer ones. Great aims, but innovation and substitution, similar wording, is used again in the EU's chemical strategy for sustainability. Is it the same or are we aiming for the next level now? It is the same in its concept, but we keep learning and we keep uh, improving. Whether it's the next level, yes, it's the next level if you're thinking of intellectual understanding, not necessarily the next level in terms of increasing protection. But I do think that, you know, you, you go back to the early 90s uh, where sustainable development was defined. That definition is exactly the backbone of the uh, SDGs that just got adopted, what is it, five years ago, and of the Green Deal. It's just that we've learned so much since then <laughs> that we can put it into much more practical uh, um, 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 conditions. We can really implement it much, much better because we understand the complexities, the interactions much better, but we also understand much better where we shouldn't act and where we therefore should focus on acting. Okay. Hey, another topic. When Rob Donkers retired, you succeeded him as a member of the Program Advisory Committee for ChemCon Conferences. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for all your ideas and support in the expansion of ChemCon Conferences into the engagement platform for the chemical industry and authorities from all over the globe. On many ChemCon events and other occasions, you were highly valued as a visionary, passionate and pragmatic compass for the direction of chemical control legislation and global cooperation. What did you like best about your involvement in international work? Ah, international work, uh, I think passion is probably the, the, the route I should take. Uh, the area of chemicals, it might be the same many other places, but I only know chemicals, so that's where I go from. Area of chemicals um, is complicated. It needs a lot of experience, a lot of insights, a lot of facets, a lot of different inputs. I mean, science, policy uh, are very close to each other. Regulation is very different around the world, uh, but we all want the same thing. And I think the beauty about international work is that if you manage to harvest all these experiences or learnings, or at least listen 
um, you can make much more informed decisions. And since the world is actually so diverse in how it manages chemicals, but all want to do it for the same objective, it's exactly harvesting that diversity and making the best of it in your context. Uh, that, that's the huge added value of, of international chemicals work. And um, that, that creates passion. Wonderful passion. We have seen a lot uh, also when uh, from 2007 to 2008, you were seconded to ECA as director of operations. You were part of the first group here in Helsinki um, to, to really set it up. Can you tell us about this pioneering time? It, it, yeah. That first year was uh, amazing. Um, it's, it's amazing from a, you know, a, a people interaction perspective, but also in terms of organizational development. I, I think uh, by that time, I was less naive and blue-eyed than when I joined, you know, when I was very, very young. So I could start observing things. And I think that if I take that first year, it is really, really healthy to once in a while just throw everything you got away and start over. And that's effectively what we managed to do because we came here with a crew of 40 people. And we had a building, but we, you know, we didn't have paper. We didn't have signatures. We didn't have all the administrative tools. And we asked ourselves, what do we need in order to make our work uh, work? Um, because in one year, we have to have an established agency. And I think that pioneering, what you might call it, uh, spirit where you start more or less from a blank sheet, but with a lot of people having lots of experience. It's a little bit like our link to the international before. Uh, lots of experience, uh, but a common goal and one year time to do it uh, from a bl blank sheet. That is an uh, absolutely amazing thing to have been part of, to have experienced um, so that's, that's what I, I would take as the main uh, uh, learning from that. No, it's, it's nice to see also that from the, those days, that same spirit and passion remains within the heart of the people at the European Chemicals Agency. Yeah? And that is always a pleasure then also to interact with them. Um, but let's move from the zeros to the tens. So your time as head of the chemicals unit um, at DG Environment in Brussels and as 2018 ECA's executive director. Before we focus on Helsinki, let's first zoom into Brussels, the heart of EU chemicals policy making, where a scientific technical angle is directly linked with a policy angle. What is your or the secret recipe for steering policy towards the best technical solutions, both achievable and ambitious? It's, I think it, it, it's a little bit linking again what we were talking about before. I mean, um, if you have a clear goal, if you have a very clear goal, um, then you will always manage to find a way to implement it. Um, and I, 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 I think that that's the thread that I definitely see. So you need to clarify the goal. You need to get enough people from the various stakeholders with diverse experiences together to say, how can we achieve that goal? Basically, lock them in a room, set a deadline, and out comes something which is, 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 is workable. And I think that um, whilst the negotiations on REACH took place, but there was also times in REACH itself where I, I was part of the team doing the same thing, where we said, look, there's a lot of calls that this is impossible. It cannot be done. Um, we, I, am convinced it is possible. So let's go down and prove it. So this was the so-called RIP, the REACH implementation projects, was one exemplification of that, where we simply said, of course, it must be doable. So let's sit down with industry, develop the guidance to demonstrate that what's in the legal text is doable on the ground. The other one was in advance of 2010 uh, registration deadline. There was many cries uh, that this won't work, and basically chemicals will be withdrawn from the market, auto industry wouldn't be able to produce cars, planes would fall out of the sky, and all sorts of other catastrophes. And we in, in, in DG Environment back then rolled up our sleeves and said, no, it must be doable. Let's sit down. We established the director's contact group, which was a direct cooperation between the commission, ICA, and industry in order to find ways to make this work. And it did. And I think that, that, that the, 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 the recipe is common goal, get enough people in there with their worries and uh, say, now you got 
so and so much time and you'll find a way and we always do. Okay, now thanks for sharing the recipe. Uh, locking people in a room is what I call the sauna strategy, yeah, which is of course a Finnish tradition. Let them sweat for a while and let them come out with a result. Um, but I wonder how such a policy potion could work for circular economy and more specific the end of waste. As you know, there are different regulations for chemicals in recycled materials and then for chemicals in primary products. To accelerate large scale private initiatives to valorize waste streams into recycled virgin-like material streams, an EU harmonized and streamlined interpretation of the end of waste status will be very valuable. What is needed to create an EU technical guidance for achieving a transparent and pragmatic end of waste certification? I think I have two facets that I will illustrate before I sort of answer the question. <laughs> I would like to clear answer this time. Huh? You're almost <laughs> retired, so you can give it. The, the, the first one is that if, if you look at, the chemo at, at all the different legislation that the EU has, then the biggest uh, uh, inefficiencies in the whole system is not in the operation of any one instrument. It is really in all the interfaces. That's where the inefficiencies are. Um, uh, so if we can get rid of the interfaces and actually merge, uh, then you'll create enormous efficiencies. So you'll achieve the same objectives with a lot less goal, uh, resources. And that's also the case with waste. Um, and as long as there are two policy areas with different objectives and different ways of doing things, uh, then the, the, the end of waste, which is the beginning of reach, will never be efficient. And depending on which side wins the end of waste um, balancing act in terms of objectives, it will, the other one will be seen as a hindrance. Okay. And that's exactly what you see right now. The end of waste is all about getting things out of waste because the less waste you have, the better it is, of course, from a waste angle. From a chemicals angle, the more you, you get out of waste into reach, the more difficult substances we have to deal with. But right now, the waste angle is the one which is pushing stuff out of waste into reach. And we are saying, homa, 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 you got a problem. So we, chemicals legislation, are a hindrance to waste. But the real reason is that we've not sat down, the policymaker, and have a common objective and basically said, you know, what is a substance that leaves waste? It is a manufactured substance, manufactured through a recycling process and adapt to end of waste. So obviously, um, we can't have uh, different rules for substances which come from a recycling process or one that comes from a normal manufacturing process. In parentheses, so many chemicals are actually chemicals because they were wastes from another process. So actually, the way chemical industry works is they don't see the difference. It's only when you happen to end up in a waste stream far out there and come back in that there is a difference. So there needs to be a merging. That's, that's, that's the, the, the main thing. And for me, if you look at waste, what is waste? It's mixtures of chemicals. Whether it's solid or, or, or liquid, it's a mixture of chemicals. So you have a mixture of chemicals which enters into the chemicals legislation and they need to be treated in one and the same way. So either you have to adapt reach to fit in with, with uh, waste or the other way around. And I, I'm, not, um, uh, I'm, I'm not one that would say one or the other. I have a personal preference because I know one better than the other, but institutionally it doesn't matter as long as they get the same and actually that the requirements are merged. And I mean merged because there shouldn't be a reach and then a waste. There should be a reach and waste. And that way we can pool all the resources. We have the same requirements, so we don't have to do them double, which means we can do double as much. Yeah. And so a guideline for an end of waste certification would be achievable then? Absolutely. And I mean, if you look at what do we do in reach, we identify substances that are the same and that are different for 30,000 substances, where we say that's a substance, that's a substance, that's a substance. So we do that uh, for 30,000. Um, and why shouldn't one be able to do something similar for substances or mixtures of substances that come out of waste streams? A very clear suggestion for Brussels. 
Now, from Brussels, a message for you from Christina de Avila, the current head of the chemicals unit. Hi Björn. It's uh, difficult to realize that this is really farewell. I will, I will cover now the, the years that we spent together in the, in the commission, although I know that you started much before that, when you were working in GRC. But of the 13 years that we shared together in the environment, these were the years marking the change in the legal uh, framework for chemicals with the adoption of uh, the REACH and the CLP regulations. It, it was the beginning of a new era, a new era of chemicals reform. And I'll bet you had to let go some of your old, your old time favorites, such as Annex 1B of, of REACH. Um, the, the new changes in the, in, the, in the chemicals regulation had very much uh, your mark. You were at the core of the hyper exciting uh, technical negotiations to salvage the low tonnage uh, registration during codecision and also the establishment of the agency. An agency and establishment that you devoted so much time and effort in the initial recruitment phase where you were for months on end doing interviews but also where you were seconded to establish the solid base uh, for the scientific body that was to help the Commission in its endeavours on science-based policy making. And then it came the implementation of it, which was definitely not an easy ride in the, in the Commission, and where some of the outputs also very much had your imprint. I can remember the, the nanomaterial registration or the second rich review. And in these years we find a mark that you left in the environment which is uh, helping with uh, the tight-knit team that we have today, that bases its culture in a solid understanding of the law and of the scientific matters at hand, uh, much with uh, extremely good uh, teamwork and uh, high spirits and a lot of fun. We like to have a lot of fun at work. And this is uh, something that uh, you have uh, taught me, that is whatever it is that we do at work, uh, no, doesn't matter how things go, the important thing is that we have fun. So your, your part two comes at the end of an era, an era that will remain vividly in my memory and that of, of many others. And I want to wish you good luck uh, for the future and, uh, of course, remind you to have fun, to have a lot of fun. <laughs> very nice. Yeah, very kind words of Christina. Uh, lots of fun is important. That's the key message. So after Brussels, you went to Helsinki to become ECA's second executive director in 2018, which was around the last REACH deadline, but REACH, of course, was far from over. Uh, actually, uh, this was more a turning point to really take a deep dive into the data pool that was generated by the REACH associates as a starting point, to, especially for industry, to further implement uh, the necessary risk management measures. Was everyone ready to take this next step? Not quite. Not quite everybody, but I mean, that's the purpose of regulation, back to what we said before. But one little thing, half our life we spend at work, half our wake life. If we don't have fun, we wasted half our life. So you gotta have fun at work and absolutely agree. Change job if you're not happy. If you're happy and having fun, then you'll do a great job. So, sorry, I have to say that. I agree with Christina there. So Key message, <laughs> key, very good. Key message. Um, back to, um, the, the, the getting to ICA registration deadline and, and was everybody ready? Well, the purpose of the regulation, the way I see it, it, it is a little bit, the regulation has to be a bit ahead. It, it has to be so that the, the front runners of industry, they, they see this as an administrative burden and nothing else. That's what they got to do. But that means that the rest of them, they really learn and they really improve. And I think that that's what we did from the very beginning. REACH was set up to be so that, you know, the big uh, front-running companies, they kept complaining it's an administrative burden and nothing else. And I kept saying that's exactly what it should be because then we get the 90% who are behind along. And what have we done with REACH? Well, REACH was all about addressing the burden of the past. Remember that slogan from the white paper. And the burden of the past has three things in it. It has what chemicals are on the EU market with what data? Is that data good data to do risk management on? And are the substances actually risk managed correctly? The registration deadlines up until 2018, we now know exactly which substances are on the European market with what data. 2027, we'll finish the joint action plan on the compliance, and we will have checked that all the data that industry has on all the chemicals on the European market is good data to do risk management. 
but we still need to make sure that the risk management is needed, uh, what risk management is still needed. So the third part of addressing the burden of the proof, that's still needed. And that's where I would say we're not there yet. Industry is not there yet, but neither are authorities. But uh, the current REACH system and then the improvements that REACH 2.0 and CLP 2.0 will bring should accelerate this so that we also can get a grip on this risk management side. The last bit of addressing the, the, the burden of the past from, from the white paper and at some point in the 2030s. Okay. Well, before we go to the 2030s, uh, let's first move to our current time, the Roaring Twenties, <laughs> where industry needs to explore, find and develop new chemicals that use less energy in production, uh, that ensure circularity, and that are less toxic. You said to me once that ECA can be the go-to place for both staff and competence on the toxicity of chemicals. Uh, and then industry can focus on the material transition, eh, like chemicals that are circular or degrade faster in the environment, etc. How should this be implemented? I, I think it's an issue of partnership, but understanding the partnership, meaning the role and responsibility of the different actors in it. And I mean, it's, it's, it's also, I would almost say business logic, even though I don't want to pretend that I understand business that well, but let's say there is some logic from business that I do understand. And that is, you know, we got 600 people here who know about toxicity. And there's no, hardly, I should say, hardly any other place in the world that has 600 people here who understand about the toxicity of chemicals. And that's, that's a, a, a competent center that the EU has established. And the question for me in the future is, can we use that competent center with our understanding in a better way, in helping industry uh, understand the toxicity? Because if we help industry understand the toxicity better, then they can focus their resources on what they're really good at, and that's putting these chemicals to a use that makes sense. Now, that partnership, it can work, I think. In a, in a sense, we're doing it in compliance check in REACH at the moment. It's, it's, it's sort of the regulatory way of doing it. But I think we have very many angles and places where we've done this, where we come with an authoritative statement on, uh, on the toxicity. It be from our RAC uh, work on the classification and labeling, on our compliance check. A little bit softer work is we're implementing this grouping approach and coming out with group assessment reports, which we published for the first time end of last year. And in that, we're also coming up with statements about what we think about the toxicity of groups of substances. And I think there we're giving a helping hand to industry to say, look, there are areas of these groups of chemicals that you really got to be careful about or really got to think about or maybe even need to go out and really investigate deeper where we have concerns. But then there are also chemicals that we don't have concerns. So I think that this you know, goes from the hard, hard regulatory classification labeling, we tell you that's it, uh, compliance check, rep, go and get that data because what you're doing here really can't guarantee safety, all the way over to the, here you have a group of substances, we think you need to really investigate this part in order to find out whether you got a problem or not. So there's a lot of support from industry possible. Um, would it also be possible to help other authorities? So would it be possible one day, for instance, that ECA becomes the global agency where also other countries in need of knowledge and information while evaluating chemicals, eh, like the United Kingdom, Korea, Turkey, etc., could benefit from this wealth of information? I, well, going global, I think uh, it's, it's, it's a very different dimension. And I, I don't see that as being a central role of, of, of ICA as such, to be the global. What I think is the big strength, and in a sense, this is looking at the EU in small and I'm amplifying into the, into the big. It's very good to have some centers of excellence. But if those centers of excellence are not attached to the countries, where the real risk management happens, where the real citizen is that, we're ha that we are uh, working for, or the real industry where risk management has to happen, if that attachment is not there, then uh, we're working in a bubble. Um, and I think that that is the strength of the union, is that we can establish an agency at European level and keep the link to the member states uh, where the real stuff happens. When you go global, the dynamics is very different. And you have to ensure buy-in. 
uh, and I don't mean buy-in in the sense that somebody is selling something, but everybody has to feel that they are part of it in order to be able to take it back. So you have the UN work uh, on, under the Conference of the Parties of, say, the Rotterdam Convention. All the parties there have to feel that they are part in order to be able uh, for that conference or, or for that instrument to actually have a meaning on the ground. If people go to, uh, to Geneva and talk for two weeks and just go back home and say, ah, then nothing happens on the ground. And that's why, let's say, ICA as a competent center globally, I w I, um, we would need to be linked into the whole globe. Therefore, I think what is much more realistic and probably also a lot stronger would be that ICA would be part of a network of global agencies uh, which provide this type of competence. Okay, so ECA could help other authorities, what they already do at the moment, eh, uh, in, in that kind of network. On the other hand, of course, it might be also a role for industry to share the knowledge they gained in Europe and implement it in all their other plans and, and, and factories around the world. Ab ab absolutely. If I look at European, our policy, uh, where there's a technical bit, so that's the angle that I'm speaking from, but, you know, with industry, we agree on 80%. And all the discussion is about the 20%. You go to mo the most of the rest of the world, they would be very happy with the 80%. So, in effect, uh, it, it would be, it, it, it's a freebie uh, for industry together with authorities in Europe to find those 80% and then help others who want to adopt 60% of it or up to 80% where we would be speaking from exactly the same speaking sheet. There would be no controversy. What we are having controversies about right now are on the finesses, uh, on the basics, we all agree. Uh, so there I definitely agree that there's a lot of potential in working with industry on these bits where we all agree. I mean, GHS is great. We all agree. Let's go out and make sure the rest of the world uses GHS. Yeah. So global cooperation and implementation of the 80% is a very good starting point. Yeah, and an efficient one. And an efficient one. Another topic. Before you joined the European Commission in 1991, your key focus was the probability theory. And I read this from paper, the definition. The outcome of a random event cannot be determined before it occurs, uh, but it may be any of several possible outcomes. The actual outcome is considered to be determined by chance. So if you look back at the three decades, what were the key factors influencing the outcomes while drafting and implementing the policies? Key factors are the people. Um, it's uh, the way I like framing it, but I need to qualify it, is the right people with the right competences in the right places. But it needs to be qualified that we need the diversity. Um, uh, but it's that mix that uh, is the key factor in getting the right outcome every time over. And here it's that there are people in the European Parliament who really understand this and really want to discuss what they understand. There are people in council that understand and want to discuss, people in the commission, and all have a common vision of where they want to go to. And then it's all about how to go there. But if you have that common endpoint, again, you have a timeline, you'll get there. So it's these few people with the right qualifications, the right, and what I mean with qualifications is not degree. It's, it's experiences at work um, from the various facets that you get together at the right time. And uh, first of all, wonders then happen. And second of all, uh, yeah, uh, you get REACH, you get CLP, you get biocides, you get some fantastic pieces of legislation out of it. Okay. Hey, over time, you had to deal with many stakeholders from industry, uh, politicians, NGOs, media. Can you give some pragmatic advice how to classify, label and package the various messages for such a wide audience? Uh, the, the, the golden rule, which I have learned the hard way, but you have from training, <laughs> is you got to speak a language that they understand. So you have to sit down and you have to understand, try to understand the people, whether they are citizens, green NGOs, politicians, technical people, regulatory scientists, understand where they're coming from. Uh, because everybody has their heart 
more or less in the right place. Uh, but they, of course, have an experience and a drive in, in one direction. So that, that's, for me, the, 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 the classification bit into the categories is understand how they think, what they think, what they value. Of course, in carrying the message, you, you, I mean, me in my job, whether it's in the commission or here, that bit is actually the same. I have to make sure, not only in making sure, I don't, I mean, I don't only have to make sure that they understand my message. I have to make sure that my message is consistent and it's well-founded, that it's, it's not uh, just a story that I'm telling. It can stand up for scrutiny. Um, but I'd say that those are the two things, that I have a storyline, which is based on real experience, stand up for scrutiny, but then take the effort to explain it within the context of these people's minds and experiences and what they value. Okay, let's see what a previous colleague at ECA, Luisa Consolini, former Director of Information oh. Systems, says about how you worked and interacted with stakeholders. Bjorn and I worked together at ECA for three years only. I retain two strong memories of him that I will try to capture in two words. First and foremost, passion. Passion for the EU vision of making Europe a safer place in the use of chemicals and possibly the entire world. Such passion gave him a crystal clarity in explaining the aims and the purpose of every single piece of regulation on chemicals. Explaining not as in explaining a difficult concept, but explaining as means of inspiration and motivation to us. My second word is prudence. But once you exercise when joining a place brimming with complexity and well-established practices. Bjorn was prudent when joining ECA, and this is why I believe, setting aside bias and easy judgment, he was able to keep quite a few good things and change others for the better. Finally now, coming to Bjorn's retirement, I remember him saying, I'm ordering books that I will read when I'm retired. Well, Bjorn, this is the moment. Go ahead, mm. excuses will hold no longer. Mm. And in the meanwhile, all the best and stay safe. Uh, grazie, cara. <laughs> so, Björn, yeah. what is the first book you intend to read? Uh, <laughs> I, I have really a lot. Uh, there are, there are numer numerous, so I, I, I haven't decided which one. Um, I have an old history book that my father gave me about five, six years ago, Danish history, uh, f uh, which is filled with catastrophic decisions from the 1800s. Um, there's a beautiful book uh, that I, I, I got as a present from a colleague about the EU system and how it, how it works. Uh, I mean, it's a novel, a uh, German book on, on, on that. I have a third one, which I started, but then that was the one I said consciously, I, I don't have the energy at 12 at night to read. I need it when I'm in pension. And that's one about the evolution of religion. And it tries to explain from an evolutionary angle religion. Three books. Okay, three books. Uh, I would suggest some lighter <laughs> material as well, but it's up to you. Um, After this trip down memory lane, a final question. The EU chemicals policy and industry are current heading for the green lane. How can this become a priority lane for all stakeholders involved? And what can we expect for the coming decades? Huge change. Uh, and I think that we all expect that we will become sustainable by 2050 and sustainable in the broadest sense. We're not talking just, you know, oh, that's it's huge climate neutrality. There are many sustainability angles that are linked linked to it, and I think that uh, that's the the big, 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 big challenge. And we all need to internalize that this challenge means enormous change. It's it's not something that we're just going to do and carry on the way we we live today. It's enormous change. If I look at the youth today, and I mean the teenagers today, um, I think they are at least giving the impression that they are willing to change. Uh, when they go to the street uh, and, 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 and demonstrate, they seem 
they want to change. We oldies, we got an obligation to change with them. And if that works, if we are able to let ourselves, our lives be changed the way that they want their future, then I think the whole green lane uh, will work. And I also think that um, we will all come together uh, with a common goal and make it work. Wonderful last words. Björn, thank you very much for this interview and all your contributions in building the EU chemicals policies and of course your dedication and support to implement these policies. On behalf of the Chemcom family, I can proudly conclude Björn the Builder, mission accomplished. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>